Just because people were more strict back in the day doesn't mean they were any less randy, baby. Welcome back to Bumblebee, everyone. I'm your host, Rachel Fisher, and let's count down our top 10 list of scandalous dating practices in history that will make you blush. Let's go. Number 10, capture over choice. Consent is my favorite word. It really is, because it's important. But back in ancient times, wasn't really a word anyone really understood. Thousands of years ago, couples skipped right over dating and instead went from captured to married. In fact, it was this idea that kind of sparked the origin of the honeymoon. A bride would be captured from a tribe, the tribe would go looking for her, and the thief would hide her away until they stopped. If you have watched the Spartan video on Bumblebee, if you haven't, go check it out, then you may know that their marriage ceremony centered on this as well, kind of, sort of, but it was, but consent was involved. As a way of courting, the women would wrestle to demonstrate their physical prowess and vice versa. They would watch the men as well and they would kind of simultaneously be like, yep, you. Then the woman's head would be shorn, they would dress them as a boy, and then they would be placed in a dark room and then wait for their betrothed to capture them and take them away. So very confusing there. I don't really understand it. But anyways, let's move on. Number nine, love letters. So nice. Today, it's easy to send a saucy text and an explicit pic to your partner or fling, or a person you're just friends with, but you know. Or the person you've been seeing for like half a year, but they're not your BF or GF, like no. Anyways, the rules are up in the air, but back then you had to wait with bated breath to receive a thought out letter from your lover, filled with poetry and extravagant flirtations and little drawings. There are love notes between Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. Henry even drew little doodles of a man depicted in lovesick sorrows. Anne then wrote back with drawings showing her talking to the angel Gabriel being like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get a son. The Tudor version of the emoji. One of their exchanges went, and I quote, If you remember my love and your prayers as strongly as I adore you, I shall scarcely be forgotten, for I am yours, Henry Rex, forever. And then Anne's response was, Be daily prove you shall me find, to be to you both loving and kind. And then he cut her head off. How quickly the milk turned sour. But it was the way to play back then, and soon you'd have stacks of letters with declarations of love as you're heading to the chopping block with the guy beside you. Awful way to go. Awful way to go. Henry, you suck. Number eight, escort cards. Today, someone might ask you for you to give them your number so they can text you, you up at like 3 a.m. No, you're not. You're asleep because you have to work the next day. If you lived in the Victorian era, you may have dropped a calling card instead, or an escort card. Want to go on a date? Here's my card. It doesn't sound so romantic, but social calling cards didn't have your usual brick printing and beige background. Social calling cards were lavish, enticing, elegant, with bright colors and lush paper. If a man wanted to court a woman, he would hand her his calling card, which would not only include his name, but compliments to her. Kind of like a Valentine's Day card, but every day of the year. If a woman was the bee's knees and she was unmarried, she'd often return home with stacks of them. If she was particularly fond of one of them, she might take up the offer presented with the card, the offer of escorting a woman to and from a future social gathering. She would send her servant to deliver the news with her own calling card in response. This process was repeated repeated several times and either amounted to something steady or flittered out. We all know what a ghosted text feels like, so I imagine this would be kind of the same. Number seven, knives. Huh? If someone ever hands you a knife outside of lending it to you to eat your lunch, be wary, they may be trying to court you. In some Nordic countries, some courtship rituals involved knives. In Finland, for example, when a girl came of age to start courting, her father would give her an empty sheath to wear. It would be attached to her girdle, and when a suitor liked her, he would put his knife in her sheath. <laughs> <laughs> if the girl was interested, she would keep it. If not, she would give it back. <laughs> Good old nonverbal communication. 
No. But also imagine putting a knife into the hand of someone you just denied. Ooh. If she kept it, this was also a signal to other suitors that she was taken and not interested in pursuing others. The idea of giving a woman a token of affection that she could use to signal her own interests is seen in many cultures such as… What's next? Number 6. Spoons. We talked about knives that fit their sheets. Now let's talk about spoons. Spoons. Dating back all the way to 17th century Wales, suitors would give ornately carved love spoons. They would make it from a single piece of wood to show his affection to his intended. On the spoon, there would be engravings which would symbolize intention, i.e., an anchor, for instance, would mean I desire to settle down, and the vine would mean something like love grows. Rural peasants used wooden spoons to eat and prepare food, so carving spoons to use every day was a usual chore. The most beautiful spoons were kept therefore to keep as gifts, to give to those you loved or wanted to. The better the spoon, the finer the details, the finer the craftsman, the better the husband, which signaled to the love interest that they were reliable and skilled. The tradition is not specifically unique to Wales, in fact it happened in many Celtic countries. Number 5. Dating and Dangerous so fun fact, after the Victorian era, or and slash kind of during, going on dates was uh Scandalous, like pretty kind of ooh. The term date is a relatively new term. It was coined just before the turn of the century. George Add wrote in the Chicago Record about young women filling up the dates in their calendar with rendezvous with young men, and that was in 1896. In the 1900s, it took a little bit of adjusting. This, therefore, set the term kind of date as women going on dates. In the 1900s, this took a little bit of adjusting. A woman out alone with a man without a chaperone at night and not a courtesan? How scandalous! As more and more women started doing it, people weren't sure how to react. Law enforcement even got involved because they would see a woman alone with a man and be like, she's a woman of the night, and then they'd arrest her or they would be confused. But either way, in the eyes of the law, dating kind of became a crime. Women making a date seemed like they were pulling something else, so sometimes it was illegal to date, though other times it was like, dude, just Stop, we're trying to go get dinner. Leave us alone. Number four, the art of the fan. Ooh. Being entirely open about who you were pursuing could raise a lot of eyebrows and damage one's reputation. So nobles often had to code their advances behind the art of the fan. Mostly women. Actually, all women. If you have ever seen Dangerous Liaisons, you may have noticed Glenn Close elegantly using her fan to seduce and manipulate gentlemen callers around her finger. And that really how it was. It was all a game only the cleverest suitors could decode. Carrying it in the right right hand in front of your face? Follow me. Placing it on the left ear? I wish to get rid of you. With the handle to the lips? Kiss me. A society lady in the 18th century was expected to know how to elegantly handle and hold a fan. This also helped differentiate between social classes. So not only was it used to set up a secret meeting in the garden with your betrothed lover, it was also used to communicate gossip and information. Number 3. Classified ads. Today we have so many dating apps, it's dizzying. You can swipe left, you can swipe right for your dream bow, any which way you like, Hinge, Tinder, Bumble, is that all there is? Plenty of fish, I don't know. It may surprise you to learn that this wasn't the first time people tried it this way. Enter classified ads. Uh, or personalized ads. If you were desperate for love and knew your person was out there but you just hadn't run into them yet, you would make an ad. In 1722, a Bostonian took space in the New England Current to put out an ad for, and I quote, any young gentlewoman that is minded to dispose of herself in marriage to a well accomplished young widower and has five or six hundred pounds to secure to him by deed of gift, she may repair to the sign of the glass lanthorn in Steeple Square to find all the encouragement she can reasonably desire." And unquote. It was written by a 16 year old Benjamin Franklin. Oh bless. Some would even put out ads to capture the attention of someone they saw in passing. Take for instance this 1748 printing calling for, and I quote, a lady genteelly dressed. This is to acquaint her that if she is disengaged and inclinable to marry a gentleman who was on that occasion is desirous of making honorable proposals. <laughs> so cute. And now we know that all those dating apps were just a matter of time. Number two, bedding ceremonies. Okay, so I can't, I can't, I can't think of anything I would like least in the world. 
uh, than to have an entire room full of guests during one of the most private moments in anyone's life, especially my parents. Ugh. Now, first comes dating, or courting, as it were. Then comes marriage, slash sometimes they would just skip over dating and just go right to an arranged marriage, especially if you were a noble. And then for a long time, comes your aunts, uncles, and parents into the bedding chamber to watch the consummation. Yay. A crowd of people would be there up until the very last second when the curtains were drawn, cheering you on. <laughs> Some would even like offer advice, like don't do that, do this. Some even stayed well past. For instance, on the wedding night of the young King Louis XIII and Anne of Austria, they had two nurses in attendance to make sure the ordeal went down. But this wasn't just in Europe, this also happened in China in the early 1900s. Number one, bundling. Probably one of the most awkward ceremonies ever to take place, As, except for that one. That's the worst. But this is specifically to do with before getting married. As we have gathered thus far, being young and in love, or just being in love in general, has never been too easy. Bundling was a way to make it easier, I guess. I don't know. This 17th century tradition involved having your beau invited over, the parents needed to approve it, of course, and then you were to spend the night sleeping next to each other bundled up to the neck or sometimes just the waist like in like a human sack and then you would sleep next to each other with a plank of wood in the middle. So romantic. The tradition was meant as a way to gauge chemistry between the two lovebirds. The two would get to know each other by talking and sleeping together only before engaging in marriage. If it didn't go well, then they wouldn't get married. If it did go well, so much so that they unwrapped each other like Christmas presents on Christmas morning, then they pretty much got married like as soon as possible. The tradition was pretty popular in Ireland, the rural United Kingdom, and the New England colonies from 16th century into the 18th, but a lot of Victorian ideals were completely against it. They were like, no, corset it up and no love. Anyways guys, that's all we have time for today. If you like this video, you know what to do. Like, bubble, <clears throat> subscribe, you know the deal. I've been your host, Rachel Fisher, and until next time, stay sweet bees.